Welcome to the Wellness Revolution Podcast, the radio show all about wellness in your mind, body, spirit, personal growth, sex, and relationships. Stay tuned for weekly interviews featuring guests that have achieved physical, mental, and spiritual health in their lives. If you'd like to have access to our entire back catalog, visit drveronica.com for instant access. And here is your host, Dr. Veronica. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Veronica's Wellness Revolution. It's hot where I am today. It's humid. And me and my guest are having bad hair days. (laughs) So this is why you say, Dr. Veronica, you don't look as good as you usually look. Bad hair day. But you're not looking at us because we have good hair or bad hair. You are listening to the Wellness Revolution because you need knowledge about a particular subject. So I'm gonna talk about a subject today with my guest. We're gonna talk about gluten once again. Why am I gonna hit gluten again? Because there's so much, everything going around with the gluten. So much everything that I can't talk to enough people. Why? Because there's myths, there's facts, there's different ways to go about it. And if you are struggling with figuring out, can I do this? How do I do this? The more people that you hear it, you might hear that piece of information that helps you get it on the road because this is crucial to your health. Now, let me say one other thing about this. Although a lot of people go gluten-free because they want to lose weight, this is not why we do the program. Going gluten-free is not a weight loss program, period, in the discussion. So if you think, I'm going off gluten because I want to drop a lot of pounds, go ahead off of gluten. But if you can keep gluten in your eating plan, I recommend that you do it because that group of foods has particular nutrients in it. And if you're not gluten sensitive, you should keep eating them. Not excessively, but everything pretty much, unless you have a sensitivity, should be in your eating plan. So having said that, I would like to introduce to you the founder of the Gluten-Free School. How about that? The Gluten-Free School, where you can go and learn how to do this. It's a little bit more. Now we have a school about it. So Jennifer, oh my gosh, you know, I always come across this. Jennifer Fugo? Yes, (laughs) Fugo. People have these names, and I'm just, everybody tells me I'm very good at pronouncing people's names, but Jennifer Fugo? Fugo, Fugo. Okay. I, my family's name got shortened on Ellis Island. So, ah, so Jennifer <laughs> Fugo, gluten free school. We're going to talk to. But what I, instead of me telling you all her accolades, I want you to hear her story about how she founded the gluten free school. So, Jennifer, welcome to the Wellness Revolution and jump right in and just start talking to the viewers about where you started on this gluten-free journey. Well, first I want to thank you so much, Dr. Veronica, for the invitation to come on your show and get to educate people about this because I know that where I started, I had never heard of gluten before. And I come from an Italian, I just mentioned my name got shortened on Ellis Island. My great grandparents came here from Italy. We still have relatives that we're connected to in Italy. So, you know, there's still a lot of traditional things about my diet. So I never heard of gluten. I was like, what? Gluten? What is that? Glue? I had no idea. (laughs) Right. It is. It is for like breads and all sorts of things because of the nature of the protein. But I think a lot of people come at this from reading things online that are incorrect and and sometimes make them afraid to eat. And that's sort of what happened to me. I mean, I was very sick for um, 27, I was 27 when I was actually diagnosed with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is not is different than celiac disease. And we can certainly talk about that if you know you ha- you haven't talked about that before. But I had terrible brain fog. I couldn't remember things. I had acne. I had rashes, these like round rashes on my arms and on my legs. I would sleep for nine to 12 hours a day and I still couldn't get up. So my husband would have to shake me and pull me out of bed. And I still could have taken a nap in the afternoon. I mean, I was just so fatigued. And I had all these digestive problems that I just thought were normal. 
You know, like how many of us are like, oh, I have stomach problems. Eh, it's, it's natural, whatever. Um, it wasn't. I would get diarrhea all the time. I had terrible gas. And like, I know people like start to chuckle. They're like, oh my gosh, you're going to talk about this. But like, if I don't talk about it, who's going to talk about it? So like my gas actually smelled so bad that my husband like got to a point where he didn't want to be around me because if wow. we, yeah. So like, I'm not, I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny because can you imagine if you're in a business meeting or you're with family or friends and you don't feel, so you're like trying to hold that in and it causes stomach pains and all sorts of problems. Um, I occasionally would get constipated, but my issues with, with, um, with gluten were more on the spectrum of just diarrhea. Like in the middle of a meal, I'd be running to the bathroom five, six, seven, eight times, like doubled over in pain, had to go now, or I would have had an accident type of emer like bathroom emergency. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really didn't know that any of this was abnormal because I'd had it so long. And what I also didn't know that was connected to this was that I had headache, chronic headaches since I was a teenager. So I've been taking Tylenol for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And that I, in about a year period had gained almost 20 pounds despite being a total gym rat and trying to eat really well and eat organic and whole grains and all that stuff. I had kept putting on weight that I couldn't get rid of and I felt very puffy. Um, not bloated, yes, but it was more just all over, just an all over puffiness that no matter how much I exercised, no matter how much I tried to diet and stuff, nothing was, the, the needle wasn't going in the direction I wanted it to head. It kept going up and I was starting to get really concerned that something like I broke, I'm like, did I break me? Like, what's going on? I'm so out of control mm -hmm. and I don't know what to do. You know, I've tried everything that I think I need to do, like cutting calories and watching my fat intake and doing all these like, and it just wasn't working at all. And so anyway, after going through a rigmarole with doctors and things and they didn't know what was wrong, I landed in a nutritionist's office and she looked at my diet and said, have you ever heard of gluten? And do you know what gluten sensitivity is? And I was like, no, no clue. You'd have to enlighten me. And it turns out that after taking gluten out of my diet within three days, oh, oh, and, and, and listen, I want to be, this is full disclosure. That is not the case with everyone. So my journey is my own and I don't want people to think, oh, I have all these symptoms, the same as Jen. So if I do what she does, I'm going to feel magically better in three days. That's not true. Some people, it takes longer than that. But my story is that within three days, the terrible gas stopped, the um, explosive diarrhea stopped, the stomach pain stopped, and I just felt overall more with it. Okay. So that was the initial thing. And, and after a week I was like, Hey, something like, even my husband said something's different. Yes, so we did, yeah. <laughs> so we did, um, blood spot testing and it turned out that I had not just a sensitivity to gluten. I have an even more severe reaction to eggs. And I'm also sensitive to the casein protein, which is found in all dairy products, including goat or sheep or anything else. Um, the cashew family, uh, the cruciferous family. So I had a lot of things that I had to take out of my diet. And when I did that, you know, again, I, I mentioned, I didn't put together the pieces that the headaches were connected or the weight gain was connected or the fact that I was getting sick about every six weeks with like whatever cold or flu or bug that was going around. I didn't know that all these things were connected to what was happening in my digestive system. And by taking them out, my life changed. I mean, if you go to my website, you can see a before and after picture. And it's not one of those things where you're like, is that person sucking in? I'm not sure. The lighting hard to tell. I look very different. <laughs> I looked so different at that point that I had friends that I hadn't seen in about a year who were like, are you okay? You look so different than I'm used to seeing you. Like, are you sick? Are you, what's going on? Cause I lost oh, a lot yeah. of weight. <laughs> and we, my husband and I hadn't put it together until we happened to be, he was on Photoshop going through photos that we were taking on our trip and had those two pictures up side by side. And he was like, Oh, now I know why people think you look different. <laughs> so, you know, it takes time, number one. Um, but when I went gluten-free back in 2008, when all this happened to me, there was, there was some books. They weren't that great. I was given three websites. Best of luck. I'll talk to you in eight weeks. And I had to figure it out myself. 
And so the whole point of founding gluten-free school, I, um, and I also want to share too, I'm not just coming at this from like what my experience has been. I worked for 10 years for my father, who's an MD and a surgeon, uh, an ophthalmologist like yourself. And, um, and so I worked right with patients with him. So I have a lot of experience firsthand of like what patients go through, not just on my own for my, myself, but also what a patient goes through when they go to the doctor's office. So I understand a lot about that. And then I decided to go back and become a certified health coach because I wanted to help people with their diet. And now I'm in the process of uh, fin- finishing my uh, final semester of a master's in nutrition. Oh. Um, Pro, yeah, program. So I'm so excited. I'm almost close to so close being done that. And I actually just started an internship yesterday with a functional medicine doctor. So I've, I have continued to take this very seriously because I understand that there's an incredible knowledge gap and it can seem so daunting and so impractical and so inconvenient and so hard and so expensive. And we could go on and on and on about all the barriers that prevent people from actually making this lifestyle change. And the reason that gluten-free school exists is not only just to educate people, but to empower them to make better choices, to be able to talk to their doctors with confidence and um, to also know that the decisions that they're making aren't nuts, that they're practical for their own lives, that you don't have to go broke doing this, and that you can be incredibly happy and incredibly satisfied living a life that happens to be gluten-free. And oh, by the way, it benefits your health if that's what you need. And I agree with you, you shouldn't ever do this diet just to lose weight. That just because that was my experience does not mean that that's going to happen for everyone. It does not mean that everybody's migraines are going to go away if they go gluten free or any number of things. There may be other, you know, like for me, I had multiple food sensitivities. I had gut issues that needed to be resolved. So it's not a quick fix. It's not a miracle. It's not some like heaven sent thing. Yes, people who are sensitive to it are going to experience changes, but um, I'm also very cautious and pragmatic about how I talk about this because there are a lot of emotional implications. There's a lot of stuff that frankly sucks, especially when you're dealing with family and friends that don't care about you know you, how you're eating now and it's an inconvenience for to them about dining out, all that stuff. Um, so I want to make it easy, simple, but I also want to make sure that people feel happy and satisfied in their lives and that the diet isn't going to drive you nuts. Yeah. So let's, let's sort of transition. And, and, I, and I, gotta, I always like to add on a little bit to what people say Please. because everybody brings out a little bit of different nuggets. And so when you went to a professional, first of all, you went to a professional because you didn't know what was going on. And so now um, gluten-free and everything is all over the place. So people may want to say, okay, well, I don't want to go to a professional and I just want to do it myself. There's more resources out there. However, let me just point out one piece of your story that was quite important. You found out you were sensitive to gluten, but and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this too. And that's what happens with people. Sometimes people go off gluten and they have sensitivities in other areas. Mm-hmm. And they say, well, I went gluten-free and it didn't work. Well, they may be the person that gluten they're not sensitive to. So I, I say that in that you ended up finding out, well, not only is it gluten, it's all these other things too. And I have all these other things affecting my digestion. And that's a completely different issue than just I'm sensitive to gluten. Right. And Dr. Veronica, to add to that, remember I said I, I took gluten out that first week. I was like, whoa. Yes. Life is different. The thing was, I kept getting really sick, like that explosive, painful diarrhea. Like every once in a while, I couldn't figure out what it was. I was like, I I don't have any gluten in my diet. I don't know why this is still happening. So, you know, I'm going to tell her that I feel better and maybe it's gluten, but maybe it's not, right? So if I was doing this on my own, I might have concluded that, yeah, I kind of feel better, but not 100%. Well, it turns out, and I didn't know this until I got those blood results back, that I have a severe sensitivity and IgG sensitivity to eggs. Mm 
And I eat a lot of eggs. And the last time I ever ate eggs, which I remember because I've still to this day, so that was 2008, I still have not eaten eggs. Um, I had egg salad with mayo in it. And I got so sick that I thought I was having a heart attack. I was at the gym working out and I was like jamming my fist into my stomach because I was like, oh my gosh. And it started here. And I could feel the pain moving down. And I was like, I need to go home. I need to go home. And partway home, I had to pull over the car because I thought I was going to pass out. I was in so much agonizing pain. So goes to show you, and you're right, that's a very good point to make and to clarify for people that if you go it alone, it can be a real challenge to pinpoint exactly what's going on. And then also too, and this is one of my biggest regrets, my practitioner never told me what celiac disease was. And celiac disease is different than being sensitive to gluten because celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. So there's a lot more implications if you have an autoimmune reaction to something. Yes. So I never got tested. So could I go and get genetic testing now to find out if I have one of the two or both of the celiac genes? Sure. Um, at this point, there's you know, I think priority. There's, there's but, I'm not, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and eat gluten for six weeks in order to get an endoscopy with a biopsy. That's considered okay. the gold standard. So, you know, I would advise somebody, if you're going to go it alone, just be aware. If you find gluten bothers you, you got to go back to the, to a gastroenterologist and find out if gluten, if you have an issue beyond just being sensitive to gluten, because having celiac disease predisposes you to developing other autoimmune conditions. Yes. And like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example, you're four times more likely to develop Hashimoto's. So most people who develop one autoimmune disease are more likely to, to end up with multiples. And that's not good. That's in a state where your body is attacking itself. So my biggest regret, that's why I say to people, it's not good to go this alone, is that you can end up being in a state of uncertainty for a very long time. And that can catch up with you down the road if you don't do it the right way. I always think the most efficient way to do it is the right way from the get-go. <laughs> not have to figure it out later on when there's a huge problem. Yeah. So one thing I just want to clarify for people, um, you said only way to get diagnosed with celiac is to get uh, an endoscopy. There are other tests that you can get that are non-invasive now that are very, 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 very predictive of it. And so if you believe that you have, if you have one of these sensitivities, then you have to go to a doctor and it's not a gastroenterologist usually. It's not usually a gastroenterologist. It's usually a functional wellness specialist type doctor that's going to know, okay, we need to get this or that to figure out whether or not you look like you have celiac versus you don't have celiac. And so understand there are other ways to test this other than cleaning yourself out and having somebody scope you. Because I know that prospect will scare people right away. There, there are, are many invasive ways that are not painful to figure it out and then you could be on the road. And you want to know, because if you're feeling miserable, you're making yourself sicker, and autoimmune diseases have all kinds of ugly complications, including organ failure. So you don't want to just do it. And let me just say, the number one causes of these autoimmune diseases are food sensitivity. Food sensitivity is what's causing a lot of this. So you have to understand what you're sensitive to. So let's talk a little bit more as we're talking about gluten. Some of the big terms right now. You mentioned one of them. I see it a lot of time. Leaky gut. I talk to people about leaky gut. And whenever I see somebody like a Jennifer, their tests come back after I do testing. And they're sensitive to, there's a 90 foods tested. They're sensitive to 80 of them. I don't say, stop eating everything. I say, they have leaky gut. And so, therefore, we have to do a digestive repair. And there's a particular protocol for that. That's is what I say. You're sensitive to everything, leaky gut. Jennifer, in layman's terms to the audience, tell people what I just said and why I said it from your perspective. Okay. So essentially, from my perspective, well, to give people a little bit more of a clarity, if you go to a regular doctor and you say, I think I have leaky gut, they're going to be like, you have what? Right. What is that? Excuse me? <laughs> that's, that's not a real thing. Um, and so you would want to use the term gut permeability because that's the correct medical term for it. And there actually is a lot of data out there and a lot of research around gut permeability. 
And one really interesting study that came up um, recently, and, and maybe I'll talk about this in a moment after I explain what leaky gut is just for, you know, in layman's terms, but there's a lot of interesting research, as you said, to to go back to that whole thing about autoimmune disease, that food sensitivity, specifically gluten actually, play a huge role in altering what can essentially stay within your digestive tract and what sneaks out into your body. So realize that your digestive system, that tube, if you want to think of it like as a hose, so the stomach to the small intestine to the large intestine, et cetera, Technically, the outside of your body, even though we think it's side, it's the outside. And there, and that hose, there's only one cell layer of thickness that constitutes that hose. So you've got one cell layer that's preventing you from getting exposed to bacteria, parasites, viruses, food particles, all sorts of things. And what can happen with gluten? And actually, so this is the study that I was talking about. As they said, they took three different groups of people, three or four actually, but they took people with celiac disease, individuals who were, I believe, gluten sensitive, and then healthy individuals who reacted not at all to gluten, and they exposed them all to gluten, and then looked at the, they call, I said gut permeability, like that means essentially, could particles pass from the hose into the body? They shouldn't be able to do that. That's not actually good. And in all cases, no matter whether you were healthy or not, gluten increased the permeability of everybody's digestive tract, a.k.a. the hose. So I'm going to reiterate this. I want to reiterate this. I'm familiar with this study, obviously. And I've heard one doctor say it at a conference. Gluten will eventually get everybody. So <laughs> gluten will eventually get everybody. So what Jennifer told you, here's what the study says, what the bottom line is, gluten will get you, even if you're not sensitive today, ultimately you will be gotten. Okay, so there's three groups of people here. You have celiac disease, you have a genetic predisposition, you're never gonna be able to handle it, horrible for gluten. Then there's other people who, just are more sensitive, their system's more sensitive and it gets turned on. And that's dose dependent usually. And so if you're eating less, you might not even realize that it was gluten. I'm one of those people, I'm sensitive to wheat. I never even realized it because I didn't have a ton of wheat in my diet. So I never realized what was happening, couldn't put it together, there it is. Because I eat it today, three days later is when you're having a problem. Group number two, sensitive, they go from people like me, who it's relatively mild, to the Jennifers of the world who, oh my God, you can't even stand in a room with her when she eats meat. Yes. And then there's that third group of people that they have the iron stomach, and the iron stomach means they can pretty much take everything, they're not really sensitive. But what we found is, in all of these people, even in the people with the iron stomachs who are not sensitive, it will begin to break down their digestive system if they eat enough of it. And so people have to understand, you eat too much gluten, eventually it will get you. And this is why if you're somebody who you notice over the years, it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. This is how food sensitivities work. And that's what happens to the ironclad people. Gluten will get everybody. And especially in this country where it's genetically modified. And so let's go into the segue about what you know about the food supply here. And you talked about traditional versus non-traditional, and you, this is important in you schooling people. Talk about that, Jennifer. Well, the traditional, well, I guess the issue with the food supply, so I have a lot of friends that work in the food industry. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I came to learn as a result of, of their, their deciding to start food companies was that our food supply is inundated with wheat. There's wheat everywhere. It's in most, you know, factories. I mean, they find wheat um, or contamination of gluten. So by the way, just to be clear with everyone, gluten is not necessarily wheat. It can be other gluten bearing grains. So you have wheat, you have barley, rye. Um, oats are an example of a contaminated grain. Uh, spelt is a form of wheat. 
uh, farro, einkorn, those are all forms of wheat. And, and so unfortunately, you can't just pick a product off the shelf that isn't marked gluten-free and look at the, the ingredients on the back. Like, let's just pretend it's nuts, for example. Like, you're at the grocery store and you want to pick up a package of nuts. And um, people will see, like, maybe a warning on the back that'll say, made in the same facility that contains wheat, eggs, dairy, soy, blah, 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 blah. Now, that's not, they don't legally have to disclose that information to you. That's something that a company will put on the back of the product. But the reason they do that is because wheat is so... It's just everywhere, and so is gluten, and it becomes a problem for people who are not just allergic to wheat itself, but also people who are sensitive to gluten, people who, are, who have celiac disease and other autoimmune diseases. So it's important to understand this is where the, the knowledge gap really um, becomes quite apparent with people, consumers especially, don't understand any of this. And they think that, you know, well, this was made in a facility that is sterilized and clean, so there shouldn't be any risk of gluten being in this because it's rice. Well, unfortunately, if the bag of rice isn't marked gluten-free, believe it or not, there's a, about a 30% chance that that rice is contaminated with gluten. There was a study done of gluten-free grains that were tested for gluten contamination. This was several years ago, and they found that about, I think it was about 32% of those grains have gluten in them um, because they were exposed or contaminated at some point along the way. It's why if you go gluten-free and you're still going to eat oats, you have to find oats that are certified gluten-free yes. because of the processing that goes on. It's typically on the same equipment. The fields are usually of oats and wheat are side by side side. So there's a lot of issues with that. And no, Quaker oats, unless they're marked certified gluten-free, are not gluten-free. I've had friends actually test them with testing kits. They are not gluten-free. So it's important to understand that what, you know, you think that like a sterilized facility is going to eliminate your gluten problem. That's not true. And that's actually not the case of your kitchen either, because gluten can hide in a number of different areas, like cutting boards, toasters, um, uh, what else? Pasta strainers. Like we think that we can just like do a once over and it's good or, oh, I'm just going to brush off the, the cutting board after I cut some bread and I'm going to, you know, make my gluten free, whatever. Um, that's not how this works. Gluten's not a virus. It's not bacteria. You can't cook it away. Um, you can't just like brush things off and say, oh, it looks clean. I don't see any gluten. There's no crumbs. It actually only takes a very small amount to make most people sick. A small crumb actually is the amount that it takes to make people sick. So it's important to understand the ins and outs, not, in your, not only in your own kitchen, but also what happens in the in the food industry, it, it forces you essentially to become your own advocate, not just for your health when you go to the doctor's office, but additionally, when you go to buy food. And so one thing that I advise people of just to keep things simple, to keep your sanity, is to buy foods that happen to be gluten-free, right? There's plenty of healthy gluten-free, because if you're sitting here thinking like, we, what can I eat? like oh, gluten and everything there's a lot there's a lot of food that's gluten-free the problem is when it's packaged right so if you're going the first thing I always tell people and Dr. Veronica I'm sure you're a big fan of this I tell people when you go to the grocery store the first spot you should go is to the wall of green along the one side and fill your cart with that. Don't go to the fruit section. Don't head into the cereal aisle or the packaged food area. Go to the wall of green and start eating real fruit, vegetables more so than fruit, but you want to have a variety of different colors in your diet. Those items are all gluten-free naturally. You can have poultry, you can have fish, you can have beef, you can have all sorts of meats, eggs, most dairy. You just have to be kind of careful with like yogurts and stuff that's, again, very processed. Um, and nuts and seeds and legumes. And again, there are gluten-free grains. There's plenty of them out there. There are plenty of gluten-free products as well. Um, it's just important that, again, you look for a gluten-free label. If you're celiac, you should look for certified gluten-free because there is always that issue that nobody's regulating the gluten-free claim that is made on package, package products. It's required by the FDA that, it's 20, uh, that a 
product test under a specific threshold in order to qualify as gluten-free, and that threshold is 20 parts per million. That said, unless the FDA gets enough complaints that people have gotten sick, like which is what happened with Cheerios, they don't do anything. They're not like randomly going and testing the company or saying, hey, are you checking your, where your ingredients came from? That's why certified gluten-free is always better because there's a protocol in place. They're actually testing those products to be beneath 10 parts per million, sometimes five, sometimes three parts per million. They do it regularly. They check the batches. They find out if the raw ingredients are gluten-free. They store them in a particular manner that makes sure that there's no um, cross-circulation of air, believe it or not, because think about it. Flour floats through the air um, that doesn't contaminate the ingredients. It doesn't contaminate the equipment. And that if it is processed, and I would tell people, don't flip out if something is made on the same equipment as other things that are made with wheat, because if it's certified gluten-free, they, number one, have to make sure that the equipment is really cleaned appropriately. And number two, they're testing the batches. So there's accountability, there's all that stuff. And yes, every once in a while there is a recall. It's not often, um, but that's with anything in life. So that's why you want to focus your diet around real food. And if you want to indulge in a gluten-free food product once in a while, you know, that's all right. It's not the end of the world. But um, I believe that real food is the best way to go. Plus, if you've been sick for a long time, you you want to get the most bang for your buck with nu nutrition. And frankly, there's a lot more nutrition in real food than there is in some like I don't know, processed rice bar. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about, you have particular tips that I think are just excellent for people to think about. You ran over some of those tips as you were talking, but let's go through the few pointers that you like to tell people. When you're going gluten-free, here are some tips that I want you to think about ahead of time, not just looking at the gluten. Yeah, you talked about the certified versus the not certified, great. What other tips do you tell people when they're going food free? Well, number one, so my number one rule that goes with that is don't be a food detective. You're not food babe. I know everybody's like, oh, food babe. She helped us find yoga mat material in our Subway sandwiches. But that, that's all well and good. But you can't find gluten in your food. I'm sorry. It does not work. You can't scan an ingredients list. Like, okay, so Dr. Veronica, I'm in multiple of these like very large gluten-free Facebook groups. And I cannot tell you, it angers me so much that people keep posting up pictures of the product with the ingredients. And they're like, do you think this is safe? I'm like, I'm sorry. Do any of us work for these companies? I don't know what's in this. I don't know how it was processed. I don't know anything. You don't know. Maybe the garlic was contaminated with gluten. Maybe the pasta sauce was contaminated with gluten because so, of so the really think on. rule number one. Because don't you, be you a just, food you, detective. You hit a pain point for me with those Facebook groups. Okay, <laughs> so, so you have to realize, being a physician who has holistic, real education and clinical experience, real, <laughs> not just my experience of one. Correct. I go into these groups. And it's a peer to peer, and I see the reason why you're sick is because you're listening to your peer and not somebody who really knows something. Correct. Rule number one should be don't get your advice from Facebook. Don't yes. get your advice from Facebook. <laughs> Give your support. But you need to invest some time into getting advice from people who really have some knowledge and background. So number rule number one is gonna be don't get your advice from Facebook. What's the matter with you? So Correct. I agree with you. All right, number number one, don't be the food label. Number two, let's go on to some more. Number two, do not buy from bulk bins, even if you're like, oh, but it's rice. Oh, but it's nuts. You don't know where the, the spoon was put. You don't know if they were cleaned. You don't know anything. So no bulk bins unless you go into a dedicated gluten-free grocery store. Okay. Um, you have to swap out your cutting board, any yeah. wooden utensils. And yes, if you have bamboo or whatever, anything that's wooden, wood-like has to go. You cannot use it anymore. If you're going to do um, a toaster, you got you to gotta get your own that's separate from the other toaster. You can't clean it. There's no way. It's not worth it. And a pasta strainer is non-negotiable unless it's one of those really nice ceramic ones where it doesn't have little tiny crevices. Um, I would just say you got to get new ones because you're never going to be able to clean all those little nooks and crannies if it's like a wire, wire or a pl even a plastic one. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like condiments are concerned, you have to have your own condiment jars. Like, so here's the thing. 
if your family is willing to do this with you and get on board, that makes life a whole lot easier because then you're just buying one of everything and everyone is agreeing within the household to just keep it gluten-free. And that's cool and that's usually the easiest and best way to go. And then when everybody goes out, they can eat whatever they want. You know, the gluten-free person eats gluten-free and everybody, you can have a hamburger with a bun, you know, fine. Mm -hmm. um, but if people are not willing to do that, you have to have multiple condiments. You have to have ones that are marked for gluten-free only and ones for everybody else. You cannot even share those squeeze bottles because if you actually watch people with squeeze bottles, they touch the bread. So those bottles are contaminated, so you can't use those. So again, you gotta, you have to get all new condiments. Anytime the knife goes in, new condiments. So it's got to be in brand new peanut butter, brand new jam, brand new whatever, um, and make sure they stay gluten-free only. You want to pay attention to body care products and especially lip products because ladies, I mean, Dr. Veronica, come on, you know that you're eating your lipstick. I eat my lips. I mean, we all know you're, we're all eating lipstick and they, it's very common that gluten is added to lipstick to keep the, it's like a binder. As you said, it's like glue. It helps hold things together. Let me ask a question about that when you're talking sure. about those products. What should people be looking for on the label to know whether or not it's okay or not? Because you go to the- You really can't. Ulta, you really can't. You go to Ulta and, and I can't tell what's, this is what I tell the people, you know, people say, well, what should I buy and how do I know it's good? I said, listen, I don't know. And so I know you don't know. <laughs> but if you the think problem. you know, that's fine, but I, no. I can't figure out this. So, so you can't figure it out either. So right. what do you tell people? I mean, nobody wants to go like, Oh, no. that's so what do you tell people about Okay, so the are thing that you need to realize that better or yes. yes, there are products and companies that do serve these uh, we're considered a specialty group, right? Anybody that's looking for vegan cosmetics or gluten-free cosmetics or allergen-free cosmetics, any of that kind of stuff, you're a specialty group. And yes, there are companies that that help work with us and are willing to go that extra mile. That means that um, you really need to do some research. So as far as like, I'm not the best resource for what makeup has gluten-free in it, but there is somebody who is, and her, um, I don't know her name, but her website is, it's glutenfreemakeupgal.com. Okay. And she is constantly reviewing stuff. So like, I'll use Red Apple Lipstick. They're really good. Um, I apologize. There's a bunch of companies and like, I don't even know their names anymore that will send me stuff and I'll use, but, um, I'm mainly concerned with what goes on or around or in my mouth. So anything like dental, I want to make sure my toothpaste is gluten-free, my floss is gluten-free, mouthwash is gluten-free, lipstick, chapstick, lip balm. Um, I'm not personally so concerned with like all the rest of my face, like foundation and all that stuff, because I don't react to it. Some people have that issue where they do. And so for them, it's important to go like all out. Now that said with body care products, like I do have to use gluten-free shampoo because my scalp gets incredibly scaly when it's exposed to gluten. And there are a few companies um, now that do offer gluten, really great gluten-free body care products. Mineral Fusions is one. Um, there are two companies that have certified their products as gluten-free. So Jason has a whole line that's certified, as does Avalon Organics. They were actually the first two body care products ever to get certified. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. I'm familiar with some of those, so I didn't Yeah. And they're that. sold at Whole Foods, and you can buy them on Amazon if you're not near a Whole Foods. So you don't, these aren't like crazy wackadoo companies. They're, they're sold, they're major brands. Yeah. Um, and Nature's Gate is another good one. Uh, Kiss My Face is another good company as well. There's a lot of companies now that are offering this. And you also want to be careful of sunscreen because sunscreen does run down your face. Um, you don't realize how, like if you're rubbing it on, who on earth goes to wash their hands after putting on sunscreen? Nobody. <laughs> no. So I actually do have a, I do have a list of gluten-free sunscreens on my website um, that I posted a few weeks ago um, that I personally called the companies. I checked lists that were old because we kept, everybody was referencing these lists from like 2005. And I was like, that seems kind of old. I should call these companies. And I came to find that 85% of those lists were wrong. Oh, wow. They were correct. Um, and so I have an updated list of all the companies that I personally contacted, that I spoke to 
somebody or I got an email back explaining exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. So um, that's up on my website. You have to be careful of supplements, um, over-the-counter drugs, and prescription drugs. So you need to speak. If you are gluten sensitive or you have celiac, you're, you've got to avoid gluten, you have to tell your pharmacist every single time, like, hey, uh, can't have gluten. Does this have gluten in it? Remind them because sometimes they'll change the formulary. Sometimes they'll change suppliers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there can be all sorts of problems. And no, your doctor's not going to know that you're now gluten sensitive. Um, dentists actually are a lot better about it than traditional doctors because they're operating in your mouth. And so, yes, um, gloves are safe. Powdered gloves are okay. I actually called because of my dad. I thought, oh my gosh, all those powdered gloves. And I was wearing the powdered gloves and I thought I was getting gluten on my hands. And it turns out that they're well aware of it. And so it's cornstarch. So if you have a corn allergy, just FYI, powdered gloves have cornstarch on them. <laughs> That's true. All right. I want to, uh, there's a couple other things you talk about, like being aware of pet free, pet treats and things like that. And also if you're gluten free to make sure you do your gluten free cooking first. And so that's mm -hmm. a great thing to remember if you're making multiple meals, but some other type of stuff that's going on out here are, um, for instance, going to restaurants and apps and things like that. So first apps, what do you say about apps that help people with a gluten free lifestyle? Apps can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. They are great because they give you options that, and it helps narrow down your search, um, especially in whatever area you're in, whether it's your local area or you're traveling. The downside is that they're crowdsourced. So just like you don't like Facebook groups, it's sort of a similar situation that you have all these people who don't know how to dine out, going to restaurants, don't know how to ask the right questions, or just simply don't know what to, what to ask at all, and then posting up on these uh, their review saying, oh my gosh, the food was amazing. The fries were fantastic. I'll show up to the restaurant and I'll be like, um, do you have a dedicated fryer? Do you have this? Do you have that? And, I, and then I'm like, that review is completely wrong. The fries aren't safe. This isn't good. Like, why are these people saying this is safe? Because they don't know. So, so uh, don't I'm trust. You can't, you have to take the apps and any reviews like with a total grain of salt and do your own homework. Um, and you really need like, to be honest with you, I train clients on how to dine out because once you know how to do it, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, I don't know. It's not as simple as just going like, I need gluten free. That's, that doesn't, that's not enough to ensure that, that you're going to meal. Yeah. Now, when you say double and triple check your meal, what do you mean by double and triple check your meal? How do you do that? When a waiter comes to your table with your meal, you say, oh, wow, that looks great. Is that, that's gluten free, right? And then he'll go, I think it is. Okay. Well, could you double check that with the chef? <laughs> Can you just double check that I got the right plate? The, the thing that's always a concern is that when restaurants don't serve on different plates, so some res restaurants like PF Chang's have totally different set of plates that identifies your meal. Um, I, it separates your meal from the other the other people's yeah. meals at the table. Well, I gotta tell you, well, I gotta let mention PF Chang's because. P.F. Chang's is great at that. And how do I know why? Because I used to go to, I, I'm very sensitive to soy. Now, not all, but so, I don't know what P.F. Chang's is doing. I would go to P.F. Chang's. I love the taste of their food. Love it. And I'd get so sick, always. Now, yeah. I could eat in another Chinese restaurant and eat a little bit of soy and I'd be fine. P.F. Chang's, I felt like I was going to die. So, some, one day, everybody decided they were going to P.F. Chang's. Well, I'm not going to be the party pooper and say, I can't go there. I went, I got their menu that was gluten-free, soy-free, and I was absolutely fine. So they obviously know how to do it. Because before I can tell you eating that same restaurant, I'd feel like we'd have to stop on the side of the road, like you said, because I thought I was going to die. I would have those kind of reactions. Absolutely. And there's, there's extra preparations that restaurants will go through. That's why people get mad when their food takes so long to come out. I'm like, you know what? I'm getting a safe meal. Like, I don't care if I have to pay a dollar or two dollars or three dollars extra. If I know that I'm not going to walk, number one, I'm not going to be like running to the bathroom every 10 minutes, which is, by the way, embarrassing and humiliating, depending on who you're out with. And it just feels awful and you want to go home. Um, so it doesn't make dining out fun. But number two, if it's safe, like, 
I'd rather eat safe food if it costs me a little bit extra than complain. I mean, I, I just think we have to look at the bright side of things in life. I think a lot of people get very negative and skeptical and um, they nitpick on things that don't really matter. And to me, it's more important to have safe food, even if it means taking an extra five or 10 minutes or that it costs a little bit extra. I'd rather the restaurant go the extra mile. So, so I, we mentioned P.F. Chang's particularly <laughs> because we, we, we have both found their, their whatever they're doing to keep people safe is working. In your experience, have you found any other restaurant names that you know that you feel also have a really good protocol to keep people safe? Or is it just restaurant to restaurants? Because I've found P.F. Chang's being the different ones, they seem to know how to do it. There's a protocol in place that restaurants as a chain will put, um, will create. Some are certified by consultants to be able to handle gluten-free diners like you and I. There's um, a program through Beyond Celiac. They were formerly called the National Foundation for Celiac Awareness. They have a program called Great Kitchens, and they train restaurants on how to handle um, gluten and such in the kitchen so that we will get safe food. So like in the Philadelphia area, the Couch Tomato is a great restaurant to go to. They've been trained. They, they proudly put the emblem of the great kitchen seal because they go, have to go through a process and keep getting that updated and renewed um, every so often. So they're great. There are some chains that are pretty good about it. Uh, I know Mangiano's is really great about it. Oh, really? Um, okay. mm -hmm. there, you know, go, I would say, seriously, go on Beyond um, a gluten-free gluten free app like uh, Find Me Gluten-Free and start checking things out. They'll usually be marked. They'll tell you if they've gone through the Great Kitchen program. Um, but even then, I mean, you, so let me just give you one quick example. There's a restaurant in Philadelphia called Cezanne. They're amazing. It's a Venezuelan restaurant. They're certified gluten-free through the Great Kitchen program. I thought that because I was ordering something off the menu, this was a while back, that and it was gluten-free. It was marked in the gluten-free section that it was automatically gluten-free, and I didn't have to tell them that I was gluten-free. Well, it turns out that what I ordered was fried in a shared fryer. Mm. And they only – so that was the lesson to me that um, – if you're gluten-free, no matter where you eat, you have to tell them up front. Even if like you're, you see it's marked gluten-free next to it, a kitchen has to go an extra mile when they know that you need to be gluten-free. So you, it's, the responsibility is on you to communicate that clearly, not just to pick something that looks good and call it a day and hope for the best. You, they're not mind readers. And so that was just a less me was, um, and I've shared that with clients ever since then, is to be very, you know, be very clear, be very upfront. If you make, the best thing to do is make reservations, tell the person at the, the, who takes a reservation, like, hey, by the way, we have somebody in our party, or I'm in the party, and I'm gluten-free, whatever. Let them know upfront. Try not to dine out at the prime times. Don't go to lunch at noon. Go at 11.45 when they're not busy. Then you're going to get more attention, and they're not going to be in a rush in the back. Mm -hmm. um, um, or if you go out to dinner, wait until, you know, de depending on where you are, just don't go at the prime time. Um, make a reservation when you can. Tr be very clear with the waiter up front. Ask for help if you need it. Talk to the chef if need be. Um, you know, and if you're just really uncomfortable, then, you know, thank them so much for trying to help you. Um, but, you know, say like, listen, I'm not, I'm not comfortable eating this. And it is what it is. But there's a lot more restaurants out there that are trying to cater to dietary needs than there were three years ago, mm -hmm. um, especially depending on where you live. But again, I mean, I don't have any issues traveling anywhere. I traveled on a book tour and I was okay. You can go into any grocery store and find, find plenty of gluten-free food, even if they don't have a gluten-free section, because guess what? The whole produce section is gluten-free. Um, and so... You know, I just, I don't want people to leave this conversation thinking this is like massively hard. It's just, it's, I guess it's like becoming a parent, you know, you, you got to kind of figure it out. And to be honest with you, it shouldn't take you more than like two to three months to get this down. If, if you don't have the time to do the research and, um, you know, then you need to go get help and you need to ask somebody to help you. That way you can get it done because the longer you expose yourself to gluten, the leakier your gut will be, so to take it back full circle, the leakier your gut will be, 
that unfortunately increase your risk, as you shared, Dr. Veronica, of increased food sensitivities, increased reactions, increased being sick, increased autoimmunity, all sorts of things. It's not like, oh, I ate gluten in this one meal, wake up tomorrow and be fine. No, it's a, it is a process that happens through your body over a series of days, weeks, months. So no, one exposure is not just like, oops, it was this one meal and now I'm fine. It's not like that. Um, so learn how to do it right the first time, it's the most efficient way, and you're gonna get better faster. So when we talk about doing it right, I'm gonna tell you, from my perspective as a physician and doing coaching, high, very high level health coaching where I'm doing, helping people with strategic eating and targeted supplements, what does doing it right to me look like? Well, first of all, as, as Jennifer pointed out, going to somebody who knows how to ferret out the diagnosis in the first place or what's going on, the sensitivity in the first place. This doesn't happen in regular doctor's offices. It just doesn't happen in regular doctor's office. Realize it, deal with it, get over it, that's mad. You're gonna to have to make the investment of both time and money to find somebody who knows what they're doing. Why do I say the investment of time? Because the people who know about this are just not around every corner, so you may have to travel. The investment of money, because those of us who do this realize that insurance is not friendly to anybody who has these issues, and so therefore we don't deal with insurance because they just make life more of a headache and say no, 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 no. So up front, instead of dealing with insurances all day, we say, here's what it's going to be, here's what we're going to get, and we move on in life. So you're going to have to make a, a, some type of financial investment. So understand, I, I just up front want people to know that if you're not willing to make the investment, first of all, you've got to make the investment in good quality food. So if you're not willing to make the investment in good quality food, then you're going to stay sick. <laughs> okay, that's, that's just the bottom line. But then expanding your team. So what else does a team look like? Well, once I've said, hey, this is what you're sensitive to, and you need to figure out how to do it, and I give you the initial coaching and some initial background, and I've sent you the computer with every day an email about your first eight weeks being gluten-free, and here's your little manual, which is most more than most doctors do, you realize, because they're not doing it on this level, then... You have to find somebody to partner with you who's going to help you do it even better level. And those are people like Jennifer. That's what I say. You got to have somebody here start on the path. But most of the time, a lot of, a lot of practitioners will say, oh, well, you have this. Don't eat this. And then they don't tell you how to do it. And so when I do coaching, which is different than just giving out a diagnosis, it's a, here's how you start down the pathway. But then you have to have partners for life. So now you said to me, I know you hate these Facebook groups. No, I don't hate Facebook groups. I think they're, I think they're very entertaining because there's a lot of misinformation on them. So I don't hate them because they make me laugh most of the time. But on the other side, the more serious side, I get concerned that people, rather than going to experts, true experts who know, and I don't even, I say, listen, I'm not an expert. I'm an authority. An expert is somebody who's self-proclaimed. I have real education and training and experience. <laughs> okay. So I'm an authority. You're an expert. Stop it with the Facebook experts and get people who have real background and authority. Jennifer would be one of those people too, because she has some real education and training that backs up her personal experience, and now she's worked with a lot of people. Plus she was in there with dad seeing real patience okay so if i can't say it anymore where people fail the most the one number one secret is you have to have the right team you do people fail you go to university of google you have all the pieces you've done all the reading you're a cocktail party expert but yet you can't implement and you're running to the bathroom every other day so here we are now here's the good piece about this jennifer has a gift she has her freeze cheat sheet for her favorite gluten-free breads, everybody goes wild because I want to eat bread. I love bread. I love bread. People are addicted. People are addicted to bread. I know. Good. But now, if you're addicted to bread and think you can't go off with it, that's a neurotransmitter hormonal problem, and we need to straighten that out. And then that makes your gluten-free journey better. Okay, so let me just say it again. If you feel like you can't give up, and I say give up gluten, and you feel like you want to murder me because I told you to get out gluten, that means your hormones and your neurotransmitters are out of balance, and there's ways through strategic eating and targeted supplements to get them back mm -hmm. in balance. And then you can do it. But then you're going to go eatbettergfbread.com. Eatbettergfbread.com. You get that free gift from Jennifer. 
gluten-free school. If you Google just gluten-free school, Jennifer's going to come up. I think, you know, I was just like kind of surfing the web one day and I just found her. And then we found out we're close to each other geographically and that was pretty cool. <laughs> Jennifer, I thank you. I'm sorry that you were sick in the beginning of your life, but it's ended up being a blessing for a lot of people mm -hmm. on the journey. And so for people like me, I can hand them off to you because I don't want to sit around and talk about gluten all day and all night. <laughs> and <go to> Jennifer. <laughs> what Jennifer. Right. What What you have? Yeah. Talk to Jennifer. <laughs> and that was that, you know, there's tons of free, great content on gluten-free school, but I, you know, I went through the work and I've compiled everything. I keep it up to date. I do, like I said, I called the sunscreen companies. You don't have to do that. I, I believe that if I'm going to give out information, it'd be something, it's something that I've referenced that, you know, if I'm going to make a claim, there's going to be a scientific reference that's that's based in real evidence um, to back things up, not just some like mouse study to say, well, this is how this is. No, like we've got to look at this from a, a real science perspective. If we want to be taken seriously as a community, then we need to do the diligence behind ensuring that the information we're providing people is accurate. And I know people are busy. I know that they don't know all this stuff. They don't have time to go get a master's degree in nutrition. They don't have the time to go to do everything that you've done, Dr. Veronica. And so, you know, that's the real big I think the big piece of this is being willing to get a team together that can help you navigate from point A to point B my goodness think about all the time you save not being sick anymore yeah that's right so we take our knowledge together I tell people you know listen by the time I've gotten to this point in my career I go e -e 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 -e, and I'm like my wheels are turning and that those are half million dollar cogs in there and I'm willing to shortcut and give you my half million dollars of information you add it on with other people who have that kind of information that really works and they get results mm -hmm. and so Jennifer has all the these tools to help you get results in your life. So I want to thank you for being on the wellness revolution. The gluten-free is not just a weight loss plan. It's not a weight loss plan. It's a way of life for people who have sensitivities. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Dr. Veronica, for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Wellness Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more on how to bring wellness into your life, visit drveronica.com. See you all next week. Take care.